have such a wonderful, fun night ahead of you. But I want to thank you all for coming out first before anything, because without you, um, it's really just Mal and I having a nice chat. So <laughs> it's great to have an audience. Um, thank you for following Talking Food in Maine. I'm Cherie Scott. I am privileged to be the host of the show. And I'm so grateful to do it with some very talented people uh, who are behind the scenes. Christina, our executive director, Gary and Damon, um, who will make us all look really good tonight, as you can see. And all of these wonderful talks live on the YouTube channel that Damon Post produces and diligently puts up for all of our folks who cannot be here um, from all over the state of Maine. So thank you all. Um, uh, we have a really fun season this year. We've had Rob Dumai here, who is the innovator, the culinary innovator for the state of Maine. Uh, he was here in October. Tonight, we have Mal, Mary Ellen Lindemann, who is officially the founder and full 100% owner of Coffee by Design. And we also have Barton Seaver coming here next month. Uh, Barton is a leading world seafood sustainability expert. So to even have the time with Barton on his calendar year out, is a, it's, it's a feat. Uh, to have him here in person is going to be pretty amazing. So mark your calendars for April 6th. That's going to be a really fun talk. And then we have Christian Hayes, uh, who's an incredible chef, humanitarian. He's been in Ukraine lately, uh, doing some amazing things. He's come back home. And uh, Christian was scheduled in January, but unfortunately he got sick. So we're postponing to May. So the date is May, I think, 18th. It's a Thursday night. Um, but without further ado, you know how in your life when you meet somebody for the first time, and they literally walk into your life and they carve their initials into your heart. Like you just, you just know that they've earned a place in your heart. That is how you feel when you meet Mary Ellen Lindemann. You cannot have a very baseless conversation with this force of nature. It is deep, it is intense, and it is something that you truly have to experience. It, there are no words. So I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to let you experience the force of Mary Ellen Lindemann because when she gets out here, as you can see in her little car that she drove, she piled it to the top and she brought us every part of the world that she has done business with and globally created partnerships with farmers all over the world and made sure they had a voice on the stage today. So I'm going to leave it right there. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mary Ellen Lindemann co-founder and now owner of Coffee by Design. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. How we grow in honor of women in coffee. Between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, sun, water, soil, and air conspire to call forth from the earth, a plant so precious as to inspire the world to awaken. We may not share the same language, but we hold the same wisdom, passed down from hands that have held the warm and fragrant dirt, have planted and pruned, watered and weeded, picked and peeled and washed and dried, hulled and hulled and bagged precious bushels of sacred red cherries. Because we listen to the land and take lessons from each other, we stand now together strong in what we've come to understand. We pick only what is ripe and ready. We have patience with what is still green and tender. We resist the impulse to grab everything at once, but instead return again and again to gather what is ready to be given. We live in conversation with the seasons. We steward and caretake savor and celebrate. We understand when one of us blooms, all of us flourish. We know a seed can stay a seed, safe in the dark, for years protected. And we know in our bones the courage it takes for the seed to crack open in order to grow. We know we are nothing alone, and so we lift each other up and cheer each other on so that we all might blossom, so that we all might thrive. This was a poem written for me when the women in coffee from, uh, well, we had 10 countries, 28 women come. Catherine Ferrier, who's a Maine poet, wrote this when I said I'm too close to this to speak my words. 
and this was a poem we wrote last year for the women in coffee who came to Maine. Thank you. So thank you. So thank you for being here. It's a privilege. I feel like we've been waiting a lifetime to be here together with COVID. Yes. Well, we, we've been uh, lucky enough that we were able to have your story on my podcast to, right before COVID. It was in the heels of COVID. And then here we are again four years later. So, so much has happened. Um, but we're going to start sort of, you know, at the beginning, because I think there's a lot of folks here today who really want to understand what coffee is, where it comes from. Um, the political climate around it and its origins. So we're going to have you give us a little bit of a coffee lesson. We're going to get all the fun coffee knowledge out of you, and then we're going to move into all the great stories. So what can you share with us about? Well, hopefully coffee? it's not all everything about coffee because it's it's amazing <laughs> what's going on in the coffee world right now. But I think the important thing is that people, not many realize, uh, coffee started uh, was founded in Ethiopia, and so yeah. it's really important that we honor where coffee came from. And there's the story of Kaldi and his goats and. He, they were frolicking after eating these red cherries. This is what coffee cherries look like. <laughs> and uh, people don't realize that coffee is the seed of a cherry. And so what it takes to actually grow that plant and then pick the ripe cherries and then get it to seed form has many different journeys that it takes. And it varies country by country, the traditions that we follow. But it is, it's a really extraordinary plant. It's extremely labor intensive. Yeah. And we have the privilege of enjoying hard work. So I read this quote today, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it literally takes like 140 liters of water to, pro to grow, process, and transport mm -hmm. the beans required for one cup of coffee. It, it depends. Correct? It depends. I mean, wow. it's the, obviously there are countries like Ethiopia that water mm -hmm. just is not easy to access. And so a mm -hmm. lot of experimentation, a mm -hmm. lot of creative, I mean, if in Ethiopia and people used to look down on it, that it was natural process and they would put the cherries out on these hammocks or on patios and the sun would bake the cherry skin off. And okay. people viewed that as not sophisticated. Mm -hmm. It actually creates an amazing fruitiness to the bean. Other places that had access to water, but because of climate change, everyone is having to address water issues. So can you tell us, you know, what are, who are the major producers of coffee mm -hmm. in the world? And then, you know, what are the sort of the, the nuances mm -hmm. with it for, versus a fruity Ethiopian and a mm -hmm. nutty Costa Rican? Mm -hmm. Can you kind of walk us through that globally? Where, where does coffee grow, you know? You know, it's interesting. We used to discuss that coffee grew around the belt of the equator. Mm -hmm. Because of climate change, we now call it the suspenders. We are having to grow higher. We buy only Arabica beans. There are different, um, there's Robusta and, and uh, Arabica, the two major plants. What's the difference? Plants. Um, literally, the, you know, Arabica, we buy ho higher grown elevation, denser, um, it's hand-picked. Robusta is lower elevation, tends to be higher caffeine, strip-picked, machine-operated. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of discussion now. We all better get used to Robusta taste um, because of climate change. Arabica is very sensitive to climate. Robusta, not so much. So there's an incredible amount of research being done with Arabica beans right now. But I think you know what's really been interesting is country by country, soil is different. Yeah. And there is so much experimentation going on. That's what, in the industry, I'm so impressed to see how farmers are really looking at how do we protect this amazing um, agricultural product and how, we, how do we do it in ways that are sustainable and also not using pesticides. I mean, really protect the land for the future. And so that's what's exciting. But every country, every region is incredibly different. So the, the, who are the top producers for coffee in the world today? It's, you know, I mean, first of all, people need to know um, coffee is the second most traded commodity globally. And so mm -hmm. just think about the number of people involved in this industry and how critical it is that we protect this industry. Um, it's interesting when people think of Colombia, they assume Colombia is the biggest producer. Colombia mm -hmm. is not. Brazil is number one. Okay. It's also important, are you talking about what level of coffee? We only buy specialty coffee. We're talking mm -hmm. about just you know, overall coffee. Brazil's number one. Mm -hmm. The biggest surprise for people is when they hear who number two is right now. Who's number two? Vietnam. Oh, wow. Okay. That was a huge shift. It used to be Colombia. Vietnam really has uh, come into the coffee industry very strongly, but again, lower quality. There was a really impressive young speaker recently who said, we can't improve the quality of it if people keep not buying our product. How can we right. invest and improve quality if you have this attitude about Vietnam? The other thing that I've shared with Suri is it's interesting. People do not think India has coffee. 
and you'll see we'll, we'll, we'll show pictures and I yeah. have things here but yeah. um, India I think is number eight coffee producing country right now that's amazing yeah well when I grew up in India I was there for 16 years and of course tea was life right so mm -hmm. tea is everything but I, I finally learned when we had this discussion that coffee predates tea in India in the 1500s and the British found a way to commercialize it down in the south and of course the British commercialized everything in India mm -hmm. and, and created a huge economic you know kind of um, market for that, but no, yeah, and that it, is interesting. And it is, it's a fascinating history of the product. I mean, as you see, everything from the Pope at one point, you know, centuries mm -hmm. ago was asked to yeah. do basically banish coffee, but they didn't know he was a coffee drinker. And here in the U.S., uh, the Boston Tea Party, you know, all of a yeah. sudden tea was boycotted, and so coffee became a very important beverage here in the U.S. Yeah, amazing. So, you know, tell us a little bit about how, um, you know, the whole journey of coffee by design started, because, you know, I know that, 1980 was a formative year for you and Alan, who was your husband at that point. Tell us about you know that whole sort of flip of the coin moment mm -hmm. that really kind of spurred the whole story for Coffee by Design. You know, I think it's you know it was actually the late 80s, and the thing that was interesting is I mean we were a young couple, we were here in Portland, mm -hmm. and the economy was really there was a major recession throughout the U.S. and downtowns like Portland were really impacted, and so. We had to make a decision, do we stay or go, and, and eventually decided we were going to move. And I'm a marketing specialist, he's a landscape architect, environmental planner. We flipped a coin. Uh, at that point, we'd researched either San Francisco or, or Seattle, and the coin, I tell people, it could have been very different for many reasons. The coin landed Seattle, we moved out there. I was head of an uh, ad agency's new business program. He worked for a large engineering firm. I would bring my research home especially coffee industry was still not as well known. Mm -hmm. Starbucks was a young company still, yeah. and I would bring my research home looking for a, an account for my agency, and uh, Alan was fascinated by the ways that land was actually used in what he viewed as positive ways, mm -hmm. and I was fascinated by the culture of coffee houses. And so it was a, really a journey for us of coming back to Maine saying, why isn't someone doing something to bring our downtown back, 40% vacancy rate, and yeah. Over a number of years, finally, we realized that they we kept talking about was Thank us. You. Yeah. So in 1997, you opened up your first location. Tell us exactly mm -hmm. where it was, why you chose it, and mm -hmm. what happened that day when you mm -hmm. opened those doors. Mm -hmm. What was going on in town? Yeah, actually, it's funny. It was 1994, oh, 1994 and, and yeah. it's it's interesting because um, we decided to open in what was then the pornography district of Portland. Mm -hmm. It was starting to come back. <laughs> Um, yeah, friends, so perfect location for you guys. Um, and this is it. This is the first day at Congress Street. And mm -hmm. but the thing that was exciting was the local businesses who were there, and there was a lot of renovation going on in the State Theater. Anyone who is familiar with the State Theater, it had become a pornography theater. And then some folks bought it and did a major renovation. So there was this energy in the neighborhood. So the first day we opened, um, it was the two of us and one part timer, and we had predicted we would have 25 customers, but. Um, debt of gratitude to Bob Dylan. He decided to start touring again. Tickets went on sale the day we opened, and we had 250 customers. And um, we honestly do not remember the first day when we did memory notebooks for customers the next year to write about their memories. People wrote about the first day for us, which oh, was that's lovely. So great. Now, I know that you, you went to Brown for poetry. Alan went to Cornell for landscape architecture. The two of you hadn't spent a day in the food business. What in the world were you doing behind that bar? How did you pull that latte off? Um, I, had, I was a waitress one day. <laughs> For one day. <laughs> yeah, and, um, no, it was interesting because it was, you know, we had done our homework. We right. spent three years actually working on a business plan and, and mm -hmm. then we're told that we couldn't open this in Maine. People said, Why? oh, it's not sophisticated enough. People won't appreciate it. And so we did spend an additional three years traveling around New England and then realized um, this was home and this is where we did want to make a difference and so um, we had done our homework. I tell people don't, you know, you have to have a mission and vision statement and have a business plan. What was the mission? What was the vision? No, literally it was we were going to create an extraordinary experience for mm -hmm. communities surrounded with coffee. I mean coffee brings people together but That's we true. felt we could do it in a way that was not currently being offered here. I mean, we had really, out on the Pacific Northwest, there was a different mm -hmm. way coffee was being roasted. We were not roasters when we first opened. So you have a reputation for being a tempest in a cup. Tell me about that. Yep, tempest in a coffee pot. <laughs> um, it was interesting because right from the moment we, we started and we opened our doors, the world and what is going on within our community walked in the doors. Mm -hmm. So I think about the early days, the things we were boycotted, people boycotted us because 
we, t we really were educating people about AIDS awareness. We were across the street from the AIDS project. But you're a coffee place. What were you doing talking about AIDS awareness? If you look at the history of coffee houses, they're places of conversation. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, I'm not here to tell you how to think, but I'm telling you to do, open your eyes and see what's around you and how can we make a better world? Yeah. How do we create a better world for all of us? And to see, it was painful to watch. You would have a customer who we might know was diagnosed HIV positive standing next to someone who all they knew is there's someone standing next to me and I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. And we realized it was as simple as just saying to the customer, hey Joe, so nice to see you today and that's the person who may have been diagnosed and the other person seeing if you're at ease, I'm at ease. Mm. And so then we started having information. I think about actually in the, the very early, we opened July of 94, October mm. of 94, was when we had uh, a number of Bosnian refugees move to Portland, and some oh. of our very first customers were from Bosnia. And it's very moving to me now, all these years later, to see that they are still customers and they come in with their now grown children and their grandchildren. Wow. So this was the year when you guys won a pretty big award, mm -hmm. um, and this is pretty much right out of the gate. Tell us about mm -hmm. what that what the impact of that award was for you. What, what, what kind of validation did that bring you guys? Well, you know, we had a business? couple early on. It wasn't about winning awards. It mm -hmm. was a matter of, no, we have an opportunity to educate people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, AIDS awareness, you know, refugee situation. And um, we started, we, there was some boycotting, and then we started getting recognized. And so we won the Institute for Family Owned Business Award, but main biz then, which was really stunning for us, uh, at the time they would only give one business award, oh, business wow. leader award and we were notified that they were giving it to us. And it was the first time a small business had ever been recognized, which here in the state of Maine, where small business is the engine of Maine, yeah. my opinion, um, you know, it was just interesting that they finally saw value in the small businesses. We may be small, but we have a big voice and we have impact in the state of Maine. So let's talk about that voice. So here you are. I, I was curious when, when we were talking last about how you and Alan decided to like okay, how do we work with the folks who are, how do we find a way to traceability? So that, yes, we're educating and we're telling a story, but how are we telling the story of those who are actually making this coffee and processing the coffee and sending it over to us? So tell us about how that started a journey for you and Alan with your travels. You know, I think the thing that was important is, and I've realized this since, is we started out how do we rebuild our local community, our local mm -hmm. economy, and I'm so proud that we're, you know, the co-founders of Portland by Local and some other initiatives in Portland, but we started roasting our coffee then in 1998 and realized you need to go to origin. And as much as someone can tell you, you need to see firsthand. And we were invited to be part of the international jury at Best of Panama. And that's where this photo that you're seeing is, mm -hmm. is from. And, and uh, it was a really amazing time to hear what the issues were. Fair trade was very much the conversation that people were having. And we were hearing enough very privately from farmers that fair trade was not fair to farmers. Mm -hmm. That we believed in everything fair trade stood for, but how it was being overseen. Farmers were not really being included at the table to discuss you know, what the expectations were and really right. was it a fair price. Mm -hmm. And so we at the time decided not to get certified uh, fair trade, mm -hmm. which I think about it now and people who, oh, the, the, you can imagine what people were saying to us. And we just said, look, we really have to trust the people it's impacting and we trust the farmers. So and tell so, us a story about what a farmer's struggle would be with fair trade. Like they want to be fair trade, but how does mm -hmm. that really impact then how they actually make a livelihood? It, it is. The criteria was really challenging at the time because you had to be a small farm and part of a cooperative. There was no incentive for quality. Mm -hmm. And at the time we were working with Oswaldo Acevedo, a farmer in Colombia, and we knew that he paid his workers well above um, minimum wage, he had a pension plan, he built the church, the school, he made amazing coffee for us, the beans were extraordinary, and we knew what we paid him was yeah. sustainable for him. When there was so much demand for fair trade, we actually stopped buying his, brought a fairly traded coffee in, because you're allowed to bring them in fairly traded, but you can't put a sticker on a bag. Mm -hmm. And we, um, there were, I talk about light bulb moments. It was that moment of this is just not as good as his. But and, it's fair trade. But it's fair so trade. That's what customers want. And, and also, yeah. there was a question about the relationship. Mm -hmm. And we had broken, we felt a relationship with a farmer who we knew was doing good work. And mm -hmm. we had seen it firsthand. And so we decided 
in that moment, we need to do a better job of educating our customer. And so we stopped bringing in the fair trade coffee at the time and brought back Oswaldo. And it took months, but we rebuilt the level of Colombian coffee we were buying from him. So the lesson taken from that was, OK, we're not going to do the fair trade. We're going to go actually with quality and relationships and loyalty mm -hmm. to that relationship over fair trade. But you're going to mm -hmm. learn to tell that farmer's story well, and, and hopefully bridge that gap. Traceability. That you, have traceability. To have tra you have to have traceability. Yeah. If I can't pick up the phone and either call the farmer or say to an importer, prove it, we have our own buying criteria now. Right. As farmers have told us, is it's very expensive to get certified. We know that here in Maine, organic certification yeah. is unbelievably expensive. And so it leaves a small farmer doing great work out. And so finding out what are your farming practices make sure that it meets with our criteria, that we can mm -hmm. document it on our own. That's what's important to us. Mm -hmm. And if someone can't document it, Ethiopia is extremely complicated. They have an auction system. So trying to really make mm -hmm. sure what we are being told is accurate is very complicated. Right. That's a great story, though. Now tell us a, a little bit yeah. about this, this photo mm -hmm. here. It's a, you know, a very it, important. It, you know, we went from Panama as international jury, and the picture actually of those farmers we were with, they were part of an indigenous tribe, and their coffee did not make it to the finals, and we all were cupping to critique, and what came out of that was their coffee should have been in it. And that photo is very meaningful to me because months later, the one farmer who spoke very little English but knew that um, it's amazing, you don't need language to communicate with people. And <laughs> he, when he heard that we should have the coffee, how do I get it to you? And it was so complex trying to import at the time. We couldn't do that. But months later, I'm at a coffee show here in the US. And walking down the aisle, there he is. And again, in broken English, he said, I bet you don't remember me. And I have photographs of my travels on my business cards. And I pulled out of my wallet that photo. He said, I remember you. Um, when we were tasting the coffees there, we were in a cupping room, um, which is where you sample coffees and critique. And I looked in the ceiling, and I saw this incredible coffee bag. And they're gorgeous. And it was a beautiful bag from Bolivia and just embroidery and really colorful. And I said, someday I'd love to go to Bolivia. And other people who had been there said, no, you don't want to go there. It's really high altitude. You're going to be sick. A month later, we get the invitation, come judge best of Bolivia. <laughs> that's where this is. Oh, and, that's and, great. and again, this is an important photograph to me because the young people, there was the international jury. And then the year before we came, they selected young people throughout communities throughout Bolivia to train mm -hmm. them on coffee quality. Oh. It was not as well known there. And to have young people who knew in joining this competition, being part of it, they may not be able to return to their homes because you've now seen the outside world. Oh, um, wow. Even taking photographs, I learned my lesson the hard way. When a grandmother came after me with a machete, um, they don't like photographs taken because they think you're taking their spirit. Wow. So I learned always ask before you take a photograph. It's so, really but so this is part of the international yeah. and, and the national jury. Um, this again was the, the main biz leaders of yeah. the year award. And this was in our India Street location, which was in 98 when we started roasting coffee. So at this point, how many locations did you have of Coffee by Design in 1998? This was our third one. Third um, we location. had one, um, Congress Street was the first. Then we opened Monument Square, mm -hmm. which we ended up selling to a customer uh, later. And then we um, see coffee bugs are flying in. <laughs> Oh, and Lady it's a ladybug. Bugs. There you go. It's good luck. It is good luck. Um, but it, again, it was interesting. We started really going deeper and then decided not to do judging anymore because mm. you really don't get a chance to really go and spend time on the farm. And so we started going deeper on our different travels. Alan was traveling a lot in Colombia. Um, we were uh, members of the International Women's Coffee Alliance when it was first founded 20 years ago. And what I tell people is it's not just that we're you know, keeping an eye on women, we just know study after study shows if you support women, then the entire community thrives. And so we're very actively engaged still with the International Women Coffee Alliance. Uh, this was, this photo you're seeing right now was from my first trip with IWCA to Guatemala. Okay. This is a farm called Los Andes Estate. Um, this is the school that they have on site. It is amazing what this farm has done as far as on site education, healthcare. Um, and sustainability practices, a whole portion of their farm they've actually dedicated to um, bird friendly, but literally protection of birds. They are wow. trying to save the Quetzal bird. And so the Quetzal? The Quetzal. So wow. they have an amazing birder there that we have a video of, um, an older gentleman, cool. and he can see things that the rest of us have no, no clue are right there in front of us. Wow. 
So at this point in your in your sort of trajectory of coffee by design, like what is your heart telling you to do with, with coffee? Where are you leaning toward? You have these incredible journeys, and here's yeah. one no. that I know there's a backstory mm -hmm. to this one um, I, 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 when you were in college. And well, no, the thing that's back. really you know what's so important about coffee is you can't just talk about an agricultural product. You have to talk about a people mm -hmm. and traditions and cultures. And also, as Americans, we tend to go places and we can see where we want to make change happen, which is lovely. But we need to ask people, what do you need? What's important mm -hmm. to you? This is a project in India, and it was important to me personally because as a child, for some reason, I was always fascinated with India um, and had an opportunity when I was in, um, had just graduated from Brown, and I was a finalist for a scholarship to go and follow the Ramayana in India. Didn't get it's a holy book, the Ramayana. The Ramayana yep. is a holy book, and I was really mm -hmm. moved by the whole plight of Sita. And my degree is in poetry, so language mm -hmm. and story is important. And I didn't get it because I was so fascinated with the founder of this uh, scholarship's wife, and she kept saying, I don't have a vote. I don't have a vote. But she was fascinating, and so I chose to continue my conversation with her and didn't get selected. But, but I suddenly had an opportunity through the Women's Coffee Alliance to get an invitation to go to India, and I was invited to be a judge for the women's barista competition. And part of that is a fundraiser to help girls on farms um, get better educated. Yeah. And again, it is the trust that people who don't know us in, in trusting their children. This mm -hmm. photo I love because it is mm -hmm. a mother of a daughter who was selected to get this scholarship for a better education. Yeah. It's a world this mother has never known herself, mm -hmm. is trusting that what we're giving this daughter of hers will make a better life for her. And I just and she might never see her daughter again. And she might never see her again. Yeah. The goal is ultimately that the, the girls will want to come back to the farm and make a difference, difference. but there's no guarantee of that. So I, this photo I actually have when you first enter my home yeah. next to a picture of my daughter when she was little and me. And my daughter's actually here in the audience today, too. Yes. So. And we're going to talk about Alina yeah. in a bit. But again, so, I think the thing yeah. that's important with coffee, it is. We need to ask about coffee quality. We need to talk about mm. climate change. There's so much to discuss, but there are some really critical issues we need to understand as those who enjoy coffee. We have to pay more. We absolutely, if we are going to help coffee farmers get out of poverty and have a sustainable living, if mm -hmm. we are going to want the next generation to want to take over coffee farms, we have to be willing to pay more. When you know in every country it's different. That's why I really wanted to show a sampling of different countries because mm -hmm. you can't come up with one solution for all. Right. You know, if you know in Colombia the average age of a farm owner is in their 70s and a farm picker is 60, that's a different situation than when you're in East Africa and the average lifespan of a man in Burundi is 50 years old. Wow. There are different issues we need to be addressing. Right. So. So we're going to come back to Maine here for a minute, and we're going to talk about a huge investment that CBD decided to make. Tell us about it. You know, we had really, we'd always made a commitment to our staff that we would be based in Portland and on the peninsula. We yeah. wanted it to be live workspace, which now obviously cost of living has gone up. It's difficult for staff to do, but um, we at the time had our roastery. Uh, we had three, you know, three in Portland coffee houses. We have one inside L.L. Bean. Mm -hmm. And we were sort of fine where we were, but we knew we had maxed out. Uh, the wholesale is the largest part of our business, right. and we really couldn't grow. And so it was How a decision. How many accounts did you have at, at, at that, that time? At that time, we probably had 400 accounts, well, um, and we really couldn't grow anymore. And so there was the decision, do we stay where we are, mm -hmm. um, or do we grow? And we, Alan and I did some really deep thinking about were we done? Was there anything else we wanted to do? We were still very hands-on. And unfortunately found there was one building available for sale on the peninsula that would yeah. allow manufacturing. And so we decided, let's if the bank will finance it, we're going to buy this building. And so we went from a 5,000 square foot building to a 44,000 square foot building. Wow. And, and Diamond, I Street. Diamond, Diamond Street. Diamond Street. And I think what's really important too is that anyone who is interested in business is stay true to your vision and mission and core values. We always talk about core values in the business. Our bank, who we've been with for years, and we had always paid our loans, we were really always surpassing projections, but they had been sold a number of times. They offered to, the money to buy Diamond Street, but there were so many strings attached to it. It was as if we were working with strangers. Yeah. 
And so the night before we were going to sign, Alan called me and said, I don't think I can do this. And I said, I, I can't either. Mm -hmm. And so the owner of the building said, you have one week to find $3 million. And you found the $3 million. We, found, we actually went and did a ton of research overnight, went to five local banks that were not positioned to sell, and said, we need to know by Friday if you will do this. And late Friday night, we hadn't made a decision yet because we were working. And I, this young gentleman called us and said, obviously, you didn't choose us. I'd like to learn what could I have done better. And um, that won him the account. Wow. So tell us about so, the location. So, you know, at this point in time, coffee was very much stainless steel, clean lines. Why did you choose to, to put Diamond Street in sort of that aesthetic? I think what's really important is we're a main owned business, mm -hmm. main owned and operated. And I'm really proud of that. And there's been lots of opportunity to not have that happen. And yeah. you know, part of my decision in actually, you know, buying the 100% of the company was I, I have so many ideas for this business and I do want to stay true to Maine. We have a lot to offer here in the state and quality product and the way we treat our staff and yeah. our communities is important. But, but Diamond Street really reflected everything we believed. Um, we're not third wave. There's the third wave of coffee, which is a young, the generation below us. We're the old folks. Um, <laughs> I have a t-shirt. I'm not dead yet. Because um, they'd lead you to believe that we don't know what we're doing. And, and we really are a warm, welcoming environment. We wanted to people to come in and know we're Maine. Um, our colors of our coffee houses reflect coffee countries. Mm -hmm. So when people come in and say, oh, you're not, you know, you're not third wave, you're not, and I take that as a compliment. The woodwork mm -hmm. at Diamond Street, our old barns, main barns, mm -hmm. um, all of our steel comes from um, the Bath Ironworks area. Oh, so cool. we actually, there's history behind it, and every fixture there is nice. designed by main craftspeople. That's awesome. So this whole section here, this is about 20, 22,000 square feet, and then you have yeah. another we do. This almost 20,000 square feet. This is the coffee house section of it, which we almost didn't open a coffee house because um, every time we've opened in a location with the roastery and we have a coffee house, the coffee house and roastery are competing for space. <laughs> so this we yeah. do have, um, the coffee bar itself is about 5,000 square feet. The roastery is 18,000 square feet. Yeah. We have another side of the building that we were able to bring another main company back into Portland, which is Young's Furniture, which oh, okay. we're very happy to have another yeah. main company next to us. But if they ever choose to move out, that gives us room to grow and not right. this is the third time we've had to move a roastery you don't want to move a roastery yeah it's a lot it's of work fun. it's a lot of work <laughs> so tell us about this young lady here from you know again it's amazing the journey that you take with different farmers um, this is iris from honduras and i met her during um, actually again an iwca trip i was in honduras el salvador and guatemala and i was visiting cooperative she was doing the tour for us and the talk, and then I realized my head roaster at the time had met her before and that we were selling, um, that there was some connection with her. And I had brought, very rare that we bring coffee to farms, um, but we had created this box of women and coffee. I brought it as a gift. Handing it to her, she opens it up and tears start streaming down her face because their coffee's in the box. Oh, wow. Okay. And she wasn't expecting that. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a minute, you're Iris. <laughs> And Iris since then has now been trying to promote her individual farm as opposed to co-op, couldn't figure out how to get it into the U.S. We found an importer to bring her coffee and it is now one of our best-selling coffees. Wow. And is soon to be the coffee featured in a new product launch we're doing of barrel-infused coffees. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Why don't March you just 12th. Share? Okay, come tell come us to the launch, March 12th. We, yeah. um, it's exciting to see how the industry again is changing and for us mm -hmm. even. And we've partnered with microbreweries, our coffees and other products that we can't sell because we can't sell alcohol. And oh, that's yeah. been exciting, but there's this new trend of barrel infused coffees and you actually get a barrel in this case we're working with this launch one with three of strong down the road from us on diamond street it's gin barrels mm. you put coffee in it it's a very labor intensive process over a three month period we've had to rotate and make sure the coffee is actually absorbing the remnants of this gin um, it was a process to choose which coffee you know what would work we tried three different coffees and then all of a sudden realized it was Iris's coffee from Honduras that was really the best. The botanicals are perfect. Okay. But how, how long do you keep the coffee in there to get that? 
Uh, um, well, it's, it literally, it'll be, oh, by, by the time we finally get it launched, it'll be close to four months um, because you have to make sure that it's evenly absorbing and right. it, that it's really getting not just on the outside of the barrel, but inside. So it's, it's been an amazing journey to watch it. Uh, we just were sampling um, what's almost done. And when you roast the coffee, it burns off the alcohol content. Okay. But you have the nuances. So what I sampled cool. this week is extraordinary. And it's given us an opportunity to, because we're calling the series Spirits Alive and we're partnering with the Spirits Alive nonprofit, which uh, keeps the history of our uh, Eastern Cemetery alive. And so our coffees will be named, in the series will be named after what they call subterranean celebrities. <laughs> um, so we get to tell people about the history of Portland. And awesome. um, so it's a win-win, but yes. Iris is really, uh, Iris doesn't know quite yet that she's going to be part of this launch. So, so I'm cool. going to get an interview from her, um, from yeah, Honduras. Absolutely. What a great yeah. sort of starting point and to where it is today, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. So this is a very powerful photo. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this in Maine before. So tell us what's going on in the photo. I mean, this is Diamond Street. And I think what, you know, again, we talk about the circle of how do we help our local economy, then you go to origin, how do we do things there? And for me, the full circle is there are people who live in, within our communities from these countries yeah. we bring coffee from. And so um, these are the Burundi drummers in front of Coffee by Design on Diamond Street. And mm -hmm. When we first brought coffee in from Burundi, uh, I was not aware of how large the Burundian community is in Maine. There are estimates up to 5,000 people live here in Maine, originally from Burundi. Wow. And so we decided we were going to do a welcome ceremony. We've never done that, but Diamond Street had space. Let's welcome the coffee. And someone said, well, you have to have the Burundi representative then. And I said, we have a Burundi association in Maine. Um, yeah, we do. And then you have to have the Burundi drummers. Well, where do I get? Well, we have Burundi drummers in Maine. Okay. So I'm on the West Coast at a conference, and we're actually going to fly the woman from the Women's Coffee Alliance in Burundi chapter was going to be on the West Coast. We're going to bring her back and do a welcome ceremony. Hi. And I'm texting um, the Burundi representative who's going to introduce her. And on my flight, he says, I need to see the, the resume of who I'm greeting. I think it's to write his comments. And he informed me that someone had shown up in Portland the year before and was documenting the asylees here and reporting back to Burundi leadership. And these many people have families still there and that they were at risk. Wow. So he okay. needed to make sure that this was a safe person for him to actually be welcoming to Portland and mm. immediately got back to me and said, uh, she was my biology teacher 25 years ago, and uh, I didn't know she was still alive. And in that moment, I knew that something really special was going to happen. So mm. this is um, the video that you're going to see is of that welcome ceremony. And Alain oh, um, Jean-Claude Nehimana is the Burundi representative. We have speaking. two things, two famous things in Burundi. We have, no, three actually. <laughs> one, one is the coffee. The second one is the drummers. And the third one are Burundi people. And now we have all the three of them here. I am in coffee quality control in the coffee board. I kept coffee before sending it to you. And I thought to this project, on which we are still running with, to produce coffee of good quality, and then to sell it high price, and to be able to give back a bonus to the producers. And what she's doing with the program is totally volunteer. And so if you, if you can get a thousand people to follow you through volunteering, it's, it's amazing. And you can help increase their livelihood. It's the heart of people. It's the fact that life is bigger than themselves, which is what I see in her and what I know that she, she really is an adaptive leader. She's taking a situation where adaptive change must happen, not technical change, not you just go in there and apply this, but it's changing the minds, it's changing the people, it's bringing them along. And not many people can do that. But now we have many, many producers in the project, 788. 788 and only 365 are women. 
It's a project for family. We are saying it's empowering every, uh, everybody, the community, the men, the women, because each one can have money as a bonus if he's participated in the, in the project. Neighbors, people are hearing, ah, they distributed bonus. It's good. We are going to sell our cherries in this project. In 2014, that's crop, oh, we produced one container, more than one container, 352 green coffee bags. And I'm so appreciative that Phyllis Johnson, who you'll hear from in a bit, joined us and approached us about bringing in this outstanding coffee from the IWCA, the International Women's Coffee Alliance Group, and their women's cooperative. There's some things happening in the world where women don't necessarily have the same rights as, as men. And Isabel has been able to develop pro a program on the ground in Burundi with this coffee where women are able to get paid. They may not own the land, but they're able to get paid for the cherries. So this is a powerful, powerful coffee. It does a lot more than taste good in the cup. It helps to change the world a little bit. For those who don't know, the Burundi rural economy is really in the hands of women. And most of the time in the society where men dominate, they don't really yield uh, for the efforts they provide. So this project through coffee that we drink here in the Western countries, and with the approach you have your business, Mary and Alan, you really change people's lives. It has an impact. We not only drink coffee, we're empowering women somewhere in the world, and people's families, people's future get more brighter. I really feel very proud I didn't know you speak English. <laughs> she does. From biology to coffee and then English. You're a great teacher and a great learner. And I would not surprise if tomorrow you are the president of Burundi, probably. <laughs> Since I've been mayor, I, I think I've given out a key to the city to maybe 15, uh, uh, 20 people, Nobel Prize uh, winners and others. But there's nobody that's more richly deserving uh, the key to the city than you. So, uh, congratulations. That's awesome. I think what's important too is that was April of that year and I was supposed to go to Burundi that summer and the president of Burundi at the time was unwilling to step down after his second term and so killing started again so we were not allowed to travel. Mm -hmm. I went finally the year after um, yeah. and it was the first time, I, when I travel if people ask where I'm from I say Maine, they ask is that United States? I'm in a remote region of Burundi and someone said are you from Portland? And I ended up meeting people's family members that, who they may never see again. I came back with duffels of uh, presents for family members. It was really extraordinary. I think it's important too that that's where the next slide, you know, think about the countries where coffee has grown and think mm -hmm. about the hardship, you know, climate change, war, everything mm -hmm. else. The slide that was just up was um, when I went to Rwanda, um, I was arrived the day before my work and decided to go on a tour and I said, I need to understand the context of genocide. I need to really, and what I'm seeing here, which is extremely progressive and I'm impressed, but I need to understand what happened here. Mm -hmm. What I felt very uh, sh ashamed, if you will, is uh, I was unaware the year that we started our business was the year of the genocide. So, so much that I knew, you know, obviously I knew that there had been the genocide. I didn't realize all the details until I went to Rwanda. Um, and so it was important that I understand, again, the context of people. This photo is important. The woman who's in the middle, um, Farah, is someone who had left during, um, you know, her family had left. And as typically happens, the families move and they end up in Europe and a number of places. 
she went back, uh, lives in New York City, but ended up buying a coffee farm in Lake Kivu in Rwanda, and said, boy, I should have <laughs> done a little more research on this one. But we went to see this amazing farm. And the, the several things, again, it shows what a small world it is, mm -hmm. and keep it simple, stupid, is what I keep telling myself. It was on her farm when she showed me that her workers were trying to figure out how to make sure, you have to make sure coffees are the exact red before you pick them. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you're strip picking, and it's not good quality. She wanted to buy an expensive piece of equipment, and one of the workers said, what if we just do this? So I wear a red bracelet. It's just a simple cloth bracelet, you know, penny. And her worker said, when we're picking, we can just have bracelets on, and we'll know that's the right color. Um, for all, several months later, there was a conference in the U.S. For all, was at the conference, said, I can't come up to Maine. Mm -hmm. But I promise you, I will a few months uh, later she calls me and sure enough she's going to come up comes to visit me and I said wow you know you ended up spending time in Switzerland you need to meet Alain Nehemana he was an asylee in Switzerland they meet turns out they used to take the same bus to school then I introduced her to Papi Bongibo had a Congolese community she had spent time in Congo they had connections but the really again it just shows coffee brings people together and we're mm -hmm. all so connected is I brought her to there's an amazing um, Taylor in Portland from Democratic Republic of Congo, Adele Ngoy, and Adele uh, has just an amazing story herself, but uh, for us said, I have a family member getting married, maybe I can get something made, and she and Adele are up front talking, and I'm in the back, and Bijou, Adele's assistant, um, suddenly I could tell something's happened, and I said, are you ill? And all of a sudden she said, when I was little, there was, I had a friend. And we were neighbors, but then as happens, we all have to keep moving. And I, I, I said, Bijou, do you recognize a voice? And she said, I, there was someone I knew, they'd be a few years older. And I said, Farah, can you come in the back? And tears, both of them streaming down their faces. They were childhood friends who never thought they'd see each other again. Oh my gosh. From the journey and said, literally, Farah, who's not the, the most teary person, would just she said, if there was anyone I'd ever want to see again in my life, she's right in front of me here in Portland, Maine. So coffee really is that community connector <laughs> on so many levels. So, yeah. so this was important. You know, again, that's just some, how do we constantly remind ourselves here in Maine? Like, what do we do and who are we as a community? And this is a gorgeous mural. If you haven't seen our Diamond Street building, this is a project we did with USM. They were bringing a visiting artist. Um, um, Musana uh, from Ali and they said oh there's a little wall that you'll be able to do something on and she arrives and she's like there's a wall and so she created a wave and then we had tables out for weeks with pieces of mirrors and all kinds of things and anyone could come and write and create and so she created this wave and there are so many mm -hmm. stories in that wall you know literally you know people who had lost friends family artifacts from their homeland we had a group of women who were too embarrassed to do um, Somali women who didn't want to be in public doing it, they did the tiles at home and had them brought to us. What I also love about this photo, though, is we have a mosque behind us on Diamond Street, and uh, the fence between us was removed. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we saw each other. And when the photographer took this photo, they didn't even notice the two young children running, yeah. um, playing after uh, prayers at the mosque next door. So I love that photo. Yeah. It's a great photo. Um, you know, again, I think what's important is, you know, we get to travel to coffee countries, and some of these people don't get to travel here, or if they go to conferences, they don't really get to taste their coffee. They're there to learn, and, and so we invited the Women in Coffee when the conference was in Boston in 2019, um, especially coffee conference. We said, we'll pay for anyone who wants to come to Maine, and we're told no one would come, and we ended up having 24 people come that year from, uh, I think it was six countries. It was like a two-day, like, whirlwind. It, it was a whirlwind. Thing. It's yeah. 48 hours. That's crazy. We literally, we get them up here, and then anyone who wants to bring coffee samples, we roast, we critique, we take them to see Portland, we take them to see mm -hmm. other businesses, because I believe you can learn from every other business. It doesn't have to be in coffee. And we wanted them to see lighthouses. Mm -hmm. And it was really an amazing, amazing um, two-day period. We also recorded every single person who participated. What should the coffee co consumer know? Like, what is the message you want them to know? And so we have all of that mm -hmm. documented. We ended up, um, and it's amazing to even look at the photos and realize how many people who have passed since we had that event. Mm -hmm. We ended up 
you know, having all of these interviews, all of this power, educating them, how do we get your coffee here? So many don't know how to even get their coffee here. Mm -hmm. And for people where there isn't good quality, how do you, how do you critique and how do you help them? Um, they, they later told us that in two days they learned more than they had in, you know, in any conference they'd been. Also, we did a, a large dinner and invited community leaders from various communities and had the good fortune that um, the governor, uh, who had just been recently elected, um, not that long before, came mm -hmm. to actually welcome the women to Maine, which was really That's awesome. a beautiful moment. Yeah. Um, we then, you know, so yeah. we go from that, and here we are. You know, um, in 2020. Here, 2020, well, you know, end of 2019, uh, it's, you know, we, you want to know how good is your coffee. And so for five years, there's a major competition uh, that Rose Magazine puts on, Roaster mm -hmm. of the Year. And you submit this really detailed document answering all these questions. You don't even get to send your coffee. And so for five years, we competed. Uh, four of the five, we made top three. I actually almost did not. Um, enter the fifth year because it's a lot of work and we missed the year before by a quarter of a point. They actually mm. called me to let me know they really did double check. Mm -hmm. We decided to do it one more time. That must have hurt. <laughs> oh, I was like, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this. And so we, yeah. uh, we submitted again and ended up winning. Um, we were notified end of 2019 that we had won, but we couldn't announce till 2020. Um, so here we are, it's, we're top of the game, we're, we're you know, <laughs> 25 years we had our later, 25th right. anniversary, we're winning most of the year, we're, we're on a roll here, and, and then, you know, after this, I go to Kenya, yeah. um, there's this great trip, I'm a member of the African Fine Coffee Alliance, Africa is my, um, my personal um, focus, I have other people who focus on Central and South America, although India now, India's in mm -hmm. my wheelhouse. Um, so I go to Kenya, to this African Fine Coffee Conference, it's amazing. I mean, this is with a mango farmer on a street that we were mm -hmm. driving by. And then the next slide actually is again with the women in coffee yeah. at the Kenya conference. Really powerful moment. And, and uh, coming back on the plane, I mean, I, I just think about February of 2020 and we're hearing something's going on and I'm getting on the plane in Nairobi and they take my temperature. I'm like, I think that there's something going on. <laughs> I think we need to take this seriously, and so came back and we started making changes within the coffee houses. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's pretty much when like COVID hit in March. Yeah, it was crazy. We, we did a major early. fundraiser March seventh, mm -hmm. huge fundraiser for the Immigrant um, Welcome Center. And the next day, um, everything. I mean, the venue said that was the last event. I, they said I shut the world down, which was. <laughs> I wasn't very proud, but we raised a lot of money for a great, great cause. Yes, yeah. Um, but very quickly, we were at this signage, curbside signage. Mm. That was the signage we had to do about telling people how you can order. We were viewed as an essential business, which meant we could remain open. People obviously couldn't come in. We had so many restrictions in place. And for people who were uh, staying on at work, we went from 75 people. We had to furlough 50 people overnight. Wow. And I'm very proud of our company. We made choices that we take care of our people. We continued health insurance. Thank God for PPP money and everything else. We, um, we kept people on health insurance. And then for people who did come to work, we paid them full time, even if they only worked part time hours. I thought these, I, these actually took my breath away the other night. I was looking at before and after. So this is mm -hmm. what the bar looked like um, before. COVID. And then if you look at the next slide, I mean, we had to take, remove everything. <laughs> Oh, wow. So you um, just like took everything. We had to there? remove everything, everything. Wow. We just had to make sure because we needed to maintain distance for ourselves. We had to make oh, sure okay. the curbside could be done efficiently. This is mm. just Diamond Street. We have um, three other locations, uh, one inside L.L. Bean that wow. we had to actually L.L. Bean gave us three hours um, before closing. Um, it was very, very quick what happened. Wow. And that's, and a, that's I think, a big location. Where I, and where I think this is so important for all of us, um, and I was saying this to Sri, I can't talk about the beginnings of the business without talking about what did we learn during COVID. And I'm so proud of being an older company because I did have to get back, not that we had changed that much, but I had to really go back to core values and who we are. And we are Maine, we are community, we work together, we help each other, even in the worst of times. Um, we are so fortunate in so many ways. And so we started looking at what are the programs we can do, even though we're restricted as to how much we can do. We launched a program called Coffee by Design Cares uh, with a, a medical resident. We chose five clinics in Portland that we thought would appreciate getting acknowledgement and treats once a week. Um, so here we are at one of the clinics. 
Um, I, it's amazing now when I look at the photos. We, one of the clinics we went to was the first COVID testing site in the state, and we were not allowed to disclose where it was. People were that afraid. Wow. Um, but we, um, and we had some really crazy stories of going to different places. We decided we would do themes of going to visit, and a friend of mine came with me and had this great idea. We're going to partner with Mexicali Blues, and we're going to <laughs> do a Grateful Dead theme. And as all of a sudden we're driving in the car, and we're all decked out, and we're like, oh my god, people are dying. <laughs> Maybe this wasn't the best idea. <laughs> and uh, we're calling the clinics, and they, they thought it was hysterically funny. I mean, they were like, we need to laugh about this because it's just so hard what we're living through here. So we did, you know, it was important, Coffee Bites on Cares. We started doing murals, oh, letting yeah. people know all the different issues, wearing masks. Yeah. We, um, unfortunately, um, Alain Jean-Claude Nehimana, the Burundi representative, died during COVID, um, 49 years old. and. Um, didn't die of COVID, but re-traumatization of isolation. Um, if you've been kidnapped and tortured and had to hide and suddenly you're being told to isolate, um, it really re-traumatizes. And so he wasn't, um, had stopped mm -hmm. eating. I mean, it was really, it was amazing yeah. to watch. But so we have an incredible mural by Ryan and Rachel Adams, who are our top-notch mural. Um, they That's are beautiful. getting nationally recognized now. So you'll see a number of murals around Portland, but now nationally, they're getting hired to do national work. So this is a memorial on the back of our Diamond Street building. Yeah. Um, really important store lunches. Uh, we, we looked at other businesses. I follow this on Facebook. I was like, okay, so oh. where are they eating today? Because you, uh, you know, you supported the press it, hotel. It, I mean, all it, the different places that shut down. You guys got lunch from there. We did. Day. We had to look at, you know, how do we support other businesses? How do we know we're in these silos? How do we support each other? And also, <laughs> a lot of these are wholesale accounts of ours. And mm. so for all of us, I what. What is it if we survive and no one else does? If mm -hmm. we work together, then we all can can thrive. I had a great story years ago. I was at a workshop and they had us all. We just met and they had us go around the room. And they gave us two vials and suddenly said the world is perfect. This is before COVID, so it's weird that now how much I think about this. We walk in and and uh, we're given the okay. All of a sudden, there's a pandemic, <laughs> and you have two vials of the cure. Go around the room one by one and decide who are you going to save. And so we went around and everyone, and finally they asked who who held onto one vial for themselves, and only one person did. And they said, "Wouldn't it have occurred to you if everyone had held onto one, and then given away, the whole community would have survived?" Mm. Isn't that amazing? And uh, so we did. We started really partnering, and then we would tag and yeah, our staff twice a week. Great. Our staff would get a lunch. Anyone who worked got a free lunch, and then we. And you had people just coming to help you guys. It do was all really, this. it was really it was amazing. Yeah. Um, so we did that. It was also just traditions we have. We give artists grants once a year. It's a yeah. really competitive process, and so we we moved forward and we continued doing it. And we did our ceremonies outdoors, wearing masks instead of indoors. So why are the arts so important to coffee by design? Where where do arts mm. and coffee come together for you? I think you know our overriding theme is progressive arts and social change. Mm -hmm. um, you really can change the world. You know, one cup at a time, and I believe the arts is an entry point to have us all better understand each other. Mm -hmm. When you go see a performance, when you read a beautiful piece of writing, it's not as threatening to get to understand someone else's feelings or their culture or their history through the arts. And so we do once a year, we have a coffee called Rebel Blend, a dollar of every pound goes in the fund, and then our staff select who on the staff will choose who the recipients are. It's mm -hmm. a statewide call for proposals. and. Yeah. Um, I think this was our 20, oh my gosh, maybe 25th year this year of doing it. And it's seed money for oh, people, yeah. but everything from, you know, we funded an opiate podcast during COVID that was vitally important to people who couldn't get treatment in person, and they had a podcast. A new Mainers book that the publisher wanted to publish but wasn't sure there'd be an audience, um, we gave the down payment money from Rebel Blend so that they would actually agree to publish it, and it did come out last year. Wow, that's so great. I'm really proud of the Rebel Blend Fund. And it's one of just many arts programs. But I do, I think that um, literally, again, small businesses can have big impact. And you don't realize it sometimes. Yeah. So that's Rebel Blend. Rebel Blend, is, it's delicious, too. Let's just talk about it. Is. It is. It's, it's one of our best fun. sellers. Yeah. yeah. I always have to remind the younger roasters that um, <laughs> you know the top three sellers are still the ones Alan and I came up with in the early days. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah. um, I think also we need to remind ourselves, think of what happened during COVID. Black Lives Matter. I mean, it really, 
there's so much if you go through just what the past three years was like and how do we take that information and how do we move it forward. And so as a business, we were very proud of the work we were doing, but said we, we need to do a better job. And so making sure that our signage let people know that we have to keep moving forward. We have to learn. Um, I believe that we're making history every single day. We don't just look at the past. We look at the history we're creating today. And so moving forward with our initiatives and yeah. how do we, how are we held accountable differently? It's, mm -hmm. it's really important. Yeah. So keeping Black Lives Matter alive. And speaking about Black Lives Matter, um, we have a very talented artist in, yeah. in Portland. Uh, tell us about him and how you collaborated with him and we another uh, tastemaker. You know, it's interesting again, how do we work together? And we had done it in the early days of our business, um, but realizing during COVID, we have to help each other even yeah. more. And so our holiday gift boxes were all themed working with other, um, other food and uh, in this case, Ebenezer Akavo has the beautiful glassware and jewelry. And you're wearing his earrings and his cuffs. Um, he's yep. a very close friend now, and mm -hmm. um, he's from Ghana. And these are Adrinka symbols. So on the side of the glassware, it says the word of whatever symbol it is. Um, my personal one that I'm passionate about right now is Sankofa. It's actually, what does that mean? It's actually the theme for co Every year I choose a theme for coffee by design, and this year it is Sankofa, which is um, the past informs your present, so you mm -hmm. move into the future. And that just really resonated with me. So we created a breakfast gift box that has um, ploy mix from Acadian culture in northern Maine. And, and that was funny. We wanted to do breakfast box during COVID, and we couldn't get pancake mix <laughs> in Maine because was everyone no was baking. <laughs> there was no flour. Um, and then we yeah. returned our call, and, and all of a sudden someone said, well, what about traditional ploy? And I said, <laughs> wow. So we ended up creating. Um, the breakfast box and with our coffee and then this ploy mix and main maple syrup and some diner mugs. The cocktail box has Ebenezer's glassware mm -hmm. and then we do a collaboration with Venus Fizz. Um, yeah. It's an espresso martini in a jar. So it has our coffee in it and you just add the vodka. <laughs> Shake it up. Um, and also truffles from Dean Sweets. And I hope you all, if you haven't grabbed yet, um, outside uh, yes, you all have treats. We have treats. Um, of... Dean makes this incredible bark with yeah. our coffee ground into it, so it's delicious. Mm, but it's the right on the table there. So. Oh yeah, let me. Oh yeah, sorry. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh -huh. you for that. that but uh, but I think that, again, it's a yeah. matter. And also, how do we keep morale up? Yeah. It was weren't we told it was two weeks? Wasn't COVID supposed to be <laughs> two weeks? It was like oh, let's figure it out. Oh, uh, done by Easter, and um, and so we did. It really became important to me having themes and words, mm. and so. Um, in tw the end of 2020, I had a friend who wrote a really brilliant piece for Inc. Magazine before COVID about four words that he was having a hard time and saw a piece of paper on the ground and picked it up and opened it up and there were four words in it. And it was gratitude, forgiveness, tolerance, and I'm gonna forget the fourth one. Um, <laughs> it's up there, gratitude. Mm. And uh, I said, wow, this is really meaningful to me and we always we campaign our windows in the stores anyhow with a, this incredible henna artist uh, Mary Dunham and so the windows were painted and people were so moved by it that we mm. ended up creating pins and people could choose the pin and we did a campaign about you know how will you make the new year different like what 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 word would you choose to live your life by and mm -hmm. and every day it was funny I would have displays in the coffee house and it would vary by day which ones were gone. <laughs> it's like, oh, everyone's having a really hard time tolerance. We're going through a lot of tolerance today. <laughs> um, so it was really fun to track. I actually just recently had to get them reprinted because people really loved them. Yeah, that was That's a great awesome. campaign. Yeah. But so again, also just really being present in the community. Someone early on said, small business owners, it's you know, small business suicide to take a stand on issues. And, I said, but you've done that for 25 no, years but, at this but, but point. But, uh, well, no, but I <laughs> said to people, every, every, every choice you make yeah. um, is a political choice if you think about it. Where you locate, who you hire, what artwork we show, where do we sponsor. And, and so we do. I, as I've gotten older, I think I'm more thoughtful about how I present my opinion on things. And I do my research. If I mm -hmm. really don't, don't know enough about something, I won't take a stand. But I do my homework. And, this is a brilliant project that T.D. de Bacare, an, an artist in Portland, did about taking a stand and kneeling. What's, yeah. What is the meaning of b being on your knee? And he, now it's, um, it's an amazing show that traveled around, the photos did, oh, but yeah. also it's becoming, it's, they're uh, finalizing it as a coffee table book. Oh, that's beautiful. That'll be coming out, so that'll be an important yeah, one. Yeah, that's this, a great shot. That's a great shot. So what's going on here? This sounds mm. 
sounds intriguing. Just listening to it and reading mm. off the page. It was, you know, again, this was during COVID. How do you mm. keep people engaged and do things outdoors? And so I wanted people to, to come to an event celebrating coffee tradition. And mm. so this was held at the St. Lawrence um, Arts Center with the World Affairs Council of Maine. And it was important to me, number one, that we started it with the Ethiopian coffee ceremony. We have a lovely family we work with, so we started out with the traditional ceremony, which if you haven't had a chance to see the ceremony, please join us when we, we do it at Diamond Street. I'm hoping this spring that Maybe we'll do it. Maybe we get it. a video of it next it, time. It's really cool. amazing to see, and don't expect it's going to be quick. It takes a while because they actually are pan roasting and preparing, and then there's this gorgeous bread that they do and popcorn and with chocolate and it, it's really and that's a coffee I mean, ceremony it's the coffee ceremony wow okay. it's really beautiful to I watch there's a video there I'd love um, to see that and uh, so this was outdoors doing that but what was interesting is having people from other cultures talk about their traditions and then Phyllis Johnson who was in the Burundi video with us was there um, and talking about she's launched an organization that talks about racial equity in the coffee industry mm -hmm. and it's not just on coffee farms but here in America as far as ownership and leadership um, of people who are black, it's she's unusual and didn't realize until as she got older, she realized how rare it was to see another black. And she shared a story. I've known Phyllis for years. We've traveled together in a number of countries. And I did not realize until this. And she's younger than I am. I'm 63. She's maybe 50 something. Mm -hmm. um, she shared the story at this event about being in a car in a station wagon with her mom, Jewel, and her five siblings and arriving. And the foreman saying, Jewel, how many workers today? She was raised in the South, and they were going to pick product. Mm. And uh, Phyllis was, I think, six at the time. So she and her sibling counted as one. Mm. And her mom was uh, not even, I don't even think, had a high school diploma and was committed that her children would be educated. and. Phyllis has a master's degree, owns her own importing company. Nice. <laughs> um, is in Rwanda right now. <laughs> so this was a very yeah. powerful event here in Portland. That's awesome. Well, it was Maine. It was great. I'm always amazed at how you know to bring people together. It's like you just have this yeah. sense about how to find when you have the vision, you see it through, and it's amazing. You're deeply connected with all of that. I, you know, the thing that's interesting is I think that um, I tell people I see information like stars in the sky, and I sometimes wish that my mind didn't keep taking information in, but I, I'm amazed. As I've gotten older, I just trust the journey. Mm -hmm. You know, what's meant to happen will happen, and all of a sudden I'll realize, wait a minute, you need to... And this, this photo here is a really good example mm -hmm. of that because you know, in the photo, I'm so proud of an event that uh, I'm on, I'm chair of, of the board for Portland Ovations, and this is actually my third year chairing the board. Yeah. Only a crazy person. You're the person. perfect person for this because Only you a crazy don't person. sleep and you have the best coffee available yeah. to you, no, so no. it's perfect. Um, and we sponsor, <laughs> but, but literally the gentleman um, all the way to the left in the light blue shirt, his name mm -hmm. is uh, Toto Kisaku. He does a place called Requiem for the Electric Chair. He's from Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. And the story, he is a prominent artist there. And it was a moment when he was arrested and literally was seconds away from being killed. Arrested and where? In Here? DRC. Oh, no, DRC. in DRC. Oh. As an artist, he was a really prominent artist and was doing outdoor performances that were anti-government. Okay. And so thousands of people were seeing it. So he was arrested. And um, in his jail, he had seen other friends of his killed. Mm. And it was the moment where the guard was, you know, and the guards stopped and said, I cannot kill you because I know you. I saw you perform. Mm. And his life was spared. And he managed to get here to the US. So the piece is about the experience. The woman next to him is Moon Machar. Um, she's an uh, extraordinary poet, activist. There's a film that's actually been done of her life uh, about um, I Am From Away that was done and was shown at the Kennedy Center last year. Oh, wow. And so I'm actually, we're hoping to get it here, the theater here. Yes, that'd be great. Um, she's amazing. And so she was the, uh, the moderator for Toto's show. And then I'm next to Papi Bongibo, who um, until recently was the head of the Congolese community of Maine and did oh, wow. above and beyond work when different asylees were brought here from Congo mm -hmm. to Maine. He was the one who made sure that they had housing and food and were really cared for. And so again, here are people who just from different areas, mm -hmm. but all came together. And so 
That's we fantastic. took this photo and then used it in ads now to show about the arts and activism. Yeah. Powerful. Giving people a voice. So here we were all of a sudden. Is COVID over yet? I don't think so. <laughs> what year um, are we in now of COVID? Uh, 2021? What year are we in? <laughs> and yes, I, I do wear a mask again at work. Um, we, it ended up very unusual that the coffee conference, especially coffee conference, is in Boston, mm -hmm. two years that are so close. So we had the women in 2019, and then it was uh, in 2022, they were bringing it back to Boston. So we put the invitation out again, anyone who would want to come. And we had 28 people show up from um, 10 countries. And it's amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. And we actually took them to Ebenezer Akabos to see his facility nice. and his process of creating jewelry and what it was to bring your traditions to U.S. Yeah. We took them to uh, Roxy Sugar of Angel Rocks Sugar down in Biddeford to see her manufacturing facility where everything is made out of bamboo fabric. Mm. Amazing story. And then we did a critique of everyone's coffees and an open to the public event. Mm. Again, we interviewed everybody about what should the American co uh, consumer know. I've written, done a documentary now of those voices, which is really incredible Maybe to watch. Maybe you can show it on, on stage one. one yeah, night. and then... Awesome. Um, and then we had this dinner, but then we had a larger community dinner again where we invited leaders from the various communities in mm -hmm. Maine to, to meet and greet and had an amazing, amazing experience. So Yeah, that's powerful. And, uh, and we're back to India. And so here we were, see, finally, see, finally to got to be, you know, finally the call to go back and travel. I really miss traveling to coffee farms. When did you go to India last? Um, before this. No, when, when this, was, oh, this was October. Oh. This is October of 2022. 2022. Um, you know, it just, it was farmers did not want us on their farms because of COVID, absolutely understandable, and all the restrictions about getting to, to origin. And so when I and received- it was a special trip because you took your- I brought my daughter. Your daughter. And so yeah. it, what was really exciting was to have the invitation to come back, but I have an 18 year old daughter, Alina, who's here this evening. And uh, Alina's had to live with parents who own a small business and all we talk about and as a parent I felt very guilty that Alina come you know came to work way too often when they were little and all the time <laughs> and, <laughs> and here was this opportunity and I was going to be judging the women's competition again and Alina had started to work for mm -hmm. us when nobody else would come to work during COVID um, mm -hmm. and Alina was 15 they had a work permit, we had no openings. All of a sudden COVID happens and Alina jumps in and I realized all that guilt as a parent. Alina had absorbed an amazing amount of information and will techni is technically way better with coffee than I will ever be. <laughs> and so we went on this trip to India together wow. and there had a chance is. and there's yeah. Alina um, at a cupping. Um, mm. They were not allowed to be a judge but were part of the prep of cupping. Sunalini mm. Manan who is, uh, is the one who launched the Women's Alliance in India, is um, probably still the top coffee cupper in Asia. This woman is extraordinary. She is elegant, you'll see in yeah. a minute. Um, she's 73 years old, is a wealth of information, gracious, modest, but boy, she knows her stuff. When you go to conferences, you can tell where Sunalini is because people are following her to have her critique their coffee. So here we are in her coffee lab um, trying so to So what are you guys doing there? What, um, what happens? You have to calibrate your taste to make sure that we're mm -hmm. all on the same page for judging. And yeah. so we had a judge there from Norway and another one um, who's actually moved a number of places, but um, she's lived in Japan. She's lived in, so they, they were very different background from us as far as, mm -hmm. you know, we're a roaster retailer and their quality control people. So it was really interesting to be with people from various and you were judging Especially. coffees from all over the world? No, we were, we were judging women. Um, it's, people were asking, why does there need to be a women's competition? There already is a barista competition in India, but it would be very unusual for a woman necessarily to be sent to the competition. And so Sunalini created, through the chapter, this women's championship, but also created a much larger event called the Cafe Sante. So it's an arts and cultural experience, and it raises money for, um, their, I think they're up to six programs now, including education for the girls on the farms. Oh, that's awesome. Which is yeah. all fundraising, and, and it just shows the impact mm. of this program she's created. Um, this is Alina with Sunalini. Um, the impact in that- Two the, very powerful people in that picture. <laughs> it's very powerful. Well, The, the it, future of coffee and the legacy of coffee well, in, that one, in that one picture. It, you know, the cool. thing that, I learned uh, so much as a parent because mm -hmm. during the time we were there, these are people I've traveled with, I've known for years, and Alina um, 
during when we were there would be like go you know sort of go mom <laughs> and and I took it very personally and then all of a sudden I had this moment of my daughter wants to be in this industry or at least consider it and is surrounding themselves with powerful interesting passionate older women I mean it was really a moment of me just saying how lucky am I and in mm -hmm. fact um, Alina's finishing up high school and uh, is actually in this advanced program right now and is taking a gap year next year and has made the decision to go back to India for four months to work with the women in coffee. So I'm very proud of that. Wow, you, sow you sowed some beans in there. You know, <laughs> it is. Yeah. And again, just it's important in everything that we do, everyone is welcome at our table and yeah. we live that every day. And for the people who come in the coffee house, it is a community and letting people know that um, we all come from different places. We all have different views, but I think ultimately what we all really want is peace. And if it's through a cup of coffee that that brings people together, but we have statements everywhere. I'm actually doing a complete rebranding or refresh of our brand because how are we not telling people all of these messages we think are important? And mm -hmm. I'll be interested to see. We did a number of surveys and talks with staff and customers and wholesale accounts. And the uh, firm I'm working with is writing a manifesto for us and I get to see the first draft uh, in a week. So I'll be Do you find like after you're going into almost your 30th year now, it's a constant mm. sort of reassessment, reinvention of vision, vision and vision or are you just kind of like fine tuning it as you go along? Because now you are the sole owner of the company as well, so mm. takes on mm. your vision. You know, I think it's interesting because again, COVID made all of us reflect on how do I want to live the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. Like what really, what do I want to be working this hard? Because I do, I work a lot of hours and I love what I do, but I really started to question it. And my background, you know, I'm a performance artist. I haven't had a chance to perform in um, a long time and really thought, well, maybe, maybe it is our time. You know, Alan was thinking maybe it was his time. He lives part-time in Colombia now. And, and what I realized is there was so much opportunity for us to continue to grow this business. And mm -hmm. I have a core team who every day I go to work um, drive me crazy but inspire me. And <laughs> I want to do a better job. And I, I want all of us to show the farmers that it's not just about money. It's about we believe in you and we're passionate. And we, if we work together, we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. and, and so out of kind of the worst of times, the darkest of times during COVID, what's come out of it for me personally is I am so re-energized and passionate about the work yeah. we do and the projects I want to do. And we do have two, the new, we've got the, the barrel infused line we're launching, yeah. but I'm also launching another coffee brand because what we discovered during COVID was our online sales went nuts. I mean, they were up 400% and we were finding wow. what the customer was wanting was even higher in coffees. Higher end coffees. Higher end yeah. coffees. They want that micro lot, unique, one of a kind. Mm -hmm. And we had looked at doing a, lot, a smaller brand that would have been, you know, lesser quality, more grocery level. And mm -hmm. it just didn't excite me that we would bring in coffees that we weren't all excited to be mm -hmm. tasting. And so, it's um, so we're launching a brand called Cartography Coffee. I think it'll be by fall. I'm hoping. Yeah. Um, Is it's, there anything about coffee that surprises you anymore? Everything I mean, you've does. been in coffee for 30 years. Everything does. I mean, going to India, I was nervous. I've been there several times before. Go, you know, I'm on a plane going to India and wondering what I'm going to see because of COVID yeah. pandemic. And we all saw the photos on TV. Mm -hmm. It was frightening. And yeah. India got hit hard, very hard at the end. There. What I saw was yeah. um, the, the strength of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, what I saw was really amazing and the improvement in coffee quality and all of that just amazed me and also experimentation. Mm. The things that we're seeing, anaerobic coffees and... What's an anaerobic coffee? Tell I us mean, about that. Well, there are all different ways that you can actually process coffee. You know, how do we get it from the cherry to the actual cup? And there are ways that there's fermentation and, you know, anaerobic has this whole, you know, deprivation of oxygen and it, it's amazing what people are doing with coffee to make mm -hmm. it creative. The whole cold brew category, which it's mm. not a trend. Cold brew is a very important part of our beverage segment now. I recently was analyzing how much even in the winter we sell. And yeah. it's, it's a really, it's its own animal right now. 
So I think the thing that surprises me is in spite of climate change, in spite of war, in spite of everything, these farmers go to work every day and create an incredible beverage for us that we, as hard as we think our job is, nothing like their work, and we get mm -hmm. to enjoy it. It's a luxury, like you said. It's not, it's not you know, coffee is a it's, luxury. It's a luxury, but I yeah. think, again, it's a matter of that's where, how do we mm -hmm. give back? And, and so for us, it's, you know, again, it's the full circle, support local community, support origin, and how do we circle back with who's here? Mm -hmm. But also, how do we look at the world and what events are going on and how do we engage? The Ukraine Strong was a really important one yeah. for us, is partnering with Partners for World Health, an incredible main founded organization. A nurse started this program when she saw waste in hospitals. You know, how many of us have been in a hospital room and things that are all wrapped that we don't use, they dispose of those. And she started to collect them until the garage in her home was overflowing and she has warehouses now. Wow. And ships products, um, not only it had been all over the world and during COVID, it now was within the US, much needed supplies. And so we, we did the Ukraine Strong Blend okay. last year and we've launched it again this month as a fundraiser for them, um, unfortunately acknowledging the one year anniversary wow, um, of year. Ukraine. Yeah. It's been a year. And of course, we're in Black History Month um, and those are some really beautiful cookies, a lot of symbolization. Yeah. This was yeah. important. This We actually did this last year because with Black History Month, mm -hmm. we really were challenged with, again, how do we how do we look at honoring um, a history and the people? And there was a local baker. It's, it's an amazing mother-daughter story. The daughter is, I think she's six, maybe, maybe 17 now, um, Lila Bean Bakery. And we saw that she was doing these really creative cookies mm -hmm. and her mom was really helping her. And I gave them the challenge, can you do cookies for Black History Month? And we selected four um, people in, who are important in black history, Amanda mm -hmm. Gorman and Desmond Tutu and mm -hmm. uh, Maya Angelou and um, yeah. Harry Tubman. And this actually, this was one of those projects that was a little too successful. Yeah. <laughs> um, she couldn't keep up with the demand and, oh. we, were, and was, we were getting inquiries from all over the country. Wow. Who was shipping these off in those boxes? She was shipping them off. I yeah. mean, I said, look, at this point, you should just take it over because <laughs> she was trying to bring them in. But it was just, it really struck a chord. And and the names of other people started sharing with me of other people who I, I've never heard of. And so can I just say something here? So you have sort of this history of really taking wonderful creative entrepreneurs and elevating them. And a, a lot of folks here might not know, or they might know, but um, there was a particular woman who came to you years ago and said, uh, I've come up with a donut and I need a place to sell it. Can you help me? And what did you say? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and yeah. where do we have um, uh, Holy Donut today? Yeah, Holy Donut. Tell us that story. Yeah. No, you know, I think what's interesting is I love that ideas that people have and all they need is just a, a break. Mm -hmm. You know, I find more and more people don't. Same thing with the new Manor population. It's They just don't know where the doors are. Yeah. And if we open the door, they're perfectly capable of walking through it. And, and Lee was one of those yeah. that she wanted to have this idea and asked to sell in one of our stores. And it very quickly went to all of our stores. And then we ended up helping when she was opening one of her retail locations and didn't have the money for equipment. And we ended up installing the equipment until she was able to pay for it. So yeah. And now she's but gone on to do so many wonderful things with Holy Donna, mm -hmm. gone past that, and she's doing other right. things with Sweet Sea. But it just goes to show that ripple effect of coffee by design truly, you know, building community, helping community, elevating the community around you and beyond the state of Maine or no, it, across it, the world. I'm proud of it. And when I see the different people, I mean, mm -hmm. the Rebel Blend winners, when I look and see in the early days people we funded who are now, you know, published everywhere and artists doing incredible mm -hmm. work because of, as they said, you know, a thousand dollars is like a million dollars when you're just yeah. starting out something. Yeah. So t tell us about that. As, as there's a lot of entrepreneurs probably here in this in this theater who um, have probably never worked a day of food service in their life, but have a dream and a vision of doing something, of being an agent of social change. Um, you used coffee as your agency, but what what would you what would be the biggest advice for an entrepreneur today? You know, I think there's several things. First of all, is you're going to hear no a lot, and I think that's important. You know, you're a true entrepreneur if every no you get. You say, I'm going to find the yes, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to, or I'm going to prove you wrong, because <laughs> um, I know in my heart this is right. 
um, a, there were some books that were really important to us. And in fact, I started pulling these books out during the pandemic. It was so funny. People said, now you really have a, you know, dated yourself um, because <laughs> well, you're well, pulling well, off the, the shelf. You're pulling <laughs> off the shelf. Um, Paul Hawkins, Growing a Business, was a really important uh, one for us early on. I mean, mm -hmm. there were several. There was one coffee book, you know, that there was that we were inspired in coffee. But, but for me, Paul Hawkins, Growing a Business, because it was in the '80s and he saw some things being done differently in businesses. That it wasn't just about profit. It was yeah. a matter of you can be profitable and still be thoughtful in how you make your money and how you spend it. Yeah. And he identified several businesses at the time that he felt were unique. And the phrase social responsibility was just being introduced. Right. And so the yeah. businesses he chose, it's just amazing when you look at it now, were Patagonia, Ben and Jerry's. Yeah. I mean, he was really spot on. But what I loved in his book that was important for us, because we had almost no money when we started, we slept on the basement in our first store. And um, it was crazy. Tell us crazy. about that story, because a lot of folks don't know about those early days of CBD. And even your own team, you said, didn't really, mm -hmm. all they'd ever seen was the beautiful Diamond Street mm -hmm. store and all the beautiful roastery yeah. machines and equipment, but none of them knew those, those struggles mm -hmm. that you and Alan can, endured in those early days. I mean, those are the there. best stories, aren't so they? So you had a State of the Bean. Tell us about yeah, the State yeah. of the Bean. We have a State of the Bean meeting annually for staff, and it's really important that we share with them the history. And so, but we did in the early days, uh, we were working so many hours, it just didn't make sense going home at a certain point, and so we had this basement shelving at Congress Street. And it was funny because there was a reporter interviewing local businesses in the coffee house one day and I'm serving people and I'm, I'm making jokes with him about, oh yeah, we've got this, you know, we sleep on the shelving. And <laughs> turned out he ends up calling me and he says, I think you all are the story. And so we're telling him about the business plan and all these things thinking we're gonna get this. And the article comes out and the headline is the slab of success. <laughs> because I told him it was sort of like a morgue that we slept on shelving <laughs> and we took turns and that we uh, forgot to mention to our part-timer what was going on and so one day she came down to get something and she saw an arm hanging off the shelf <laughs> and um, it was the perfect early employee because she came up and just said I don't need to know a lot of detail mm -hmm. but a little more information might be helpful <laughs> um, and the That's article funny. was about this is what it takes to be an entrepreneur. This is what it takes to open a business is you're willing to sacrifice everything and work mm -hmm. around the clock because you so believe in what you're doing. Yeah. And, and in fact, I cried the day when we finally had to divide the shelving. We needed more layers. And, <laughs> and so, you know, I was told that, you know, the bad news is we're doing this. And, and then recently for code, we had to change something. So the whole shelving had to be removed. And it's like a piece of history. People who knew the history <laughs> knew that they yeah. really had to sort of prepare me that I was going to go yeah. down and all the shelving was gone. But I think those, you know, those are the really important stories. Of, yeah. You know, you're willing, you have so little. And actually what I love with Paul Hawkins' book is you have so little. Um, and those people tend to do the best because mm -hmm. we have to think about every single thing we do yeah. and choose. We're resourceful. The other book that yeah. ended up being helpful that I pulled off was helpful during COVID because um, there's a woman named Faith Popcorn who's a futurist. And she wrote a book, again, during the recession in the 80s that people were not going out to restaurants as much. They were really scaling back. And so she had this whole chapter on small indulgences. Mm -hmm. If I can't do this, I'll do get the best ice cream, the best coffee. So of course we're like, but what really resonated with me when I pulled the book out was, you know, here we talked about COVID isolation, mm -hmm. social distancing, all very negative. Mm -hmm. She referred to it as cocooning, mm -hmm. that time when we all had went back to our homes and were cooking at home because yeah. we had to kind of cut back on expenses. And I thought, why don't, why do we use negative language around things like? what we had to do during COVID. It was hard, but I think some of our language, words are, words are so important. Yeah. And I thought, no, we're having to cocoon for a while. That's great. And yeah. now we're sort of back and out And now you're coming it. back with Spirit, Spirit Barrel Age Coffee. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank this you. has been enlightening. It has been such an adventure to actually really travel with you in time, like over 30 years in an hour and some minutes. So <laughs> I don't know how you did that. So thanks so much. But I wanted to end here because I wanted to give the audience sure. a moment with you and kind of pick your brain a little bit. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have you guys ask any question you like of, uh, of Mal here. You can call her Mal. The one thing I do ask is that Mal repeats the question because we are filming this. Okay. So 
our, our, our viewers okay. can't really hear the question if it's on video. So if you can just repeat it. And then we're going to do a fun giveaway. So, um, Sounds good. Yeah. So if you guys have any questions, we're going to throw this back to you, I'm sure. Um, I, I'm going to just kick this off with one last question, and that mm -hmm. is, how many cups of coffee do you drink a day? I, you know what? I, you know, not that as many as people think. I know you drink it's, that, that I know, latte I, I, No, I start with a latte in the morning. Yeah. To be honest with you, I don't drink a lot because when we cup coffees, we're sampling coffees constantly. Mm. And so I need to make sure that my palate, my palate right. really has to be clean. And I yeah. had a, we have a new head roaster who's amazing and I had an incredible <laughs> coffee. He knows we've never had a great one from Democratic Republic of Congo. So he knows that there are communities here. I've got a, so today he gave me a sample and I'm like, I can't wait to call Papi Bongivo and say, we got the one from DRC yes, that's amazing. Yes, love that. Yeah. And even the Burundi coffee. We've not been able to have great quality Burundi since we did the, uh, the welcome ceremony. And we just secured an incredible Burundi, ironically, from the same, they're called same. Washington State, the same yeah. Washington State in the same region as that one. So That's awesome. That'll be a great one. It's been a while, so that's great. Does anybody have any questions here for Mal? She's covered a lot. We did cover a lot. Yeah. But... If there's any questions, we'd love to hear. Yeah. I have one. Sorry. I have oh, sorry, Christine. <laughs> I'm just wondering, for those of us who you know, love coffee but don't know as much about it as you do and we haven't sampled as many things, what are, what are things that we can be looking for with our palate when we're trying a, a variety mm -hmm. of coffees mm -hmm. so that we can identify something that might be you know, of higher quality than another? That's a great question. You want to repeat that? No, it is. You know, the thing that's interesting, you know, the question about, you know, for people who are not as knowledgeable, how do you, you know, yeah. basically get your palate, get comfortable and familiar with what's good and what's not good. It, the thing that's very interesting is I hate when people are poo-pooing certain coffees. I tell customers, really, the best coffee is the coffee you enjoy the most. Mm -hmm. You know, we do have a criteria of what we're expecting, and it depends on the country, the region, the processing, that's all. Like, I used to not like coffee from Ethiopia because the only thing that was available was what's, you know, natural. So that sun-baked whatever yeah. added a really fruit forward. Mm -hmm. It was really overwhelming for me. And then when I finally tasted my first washed Ethiopian, it became a favorite. I think part of it is try different coffees, first of all. Even if you love Guatemalan coffee, I'll say to people, what region? Every region is distinctly different. You'll see some of the things I brought here tonight. I have all sorts of blouses from different regions of Guatemala. I used to use that as a way of saying to people, every region has a different textile pattern. The coffees from those regions are in different soil. They have different flavor profiles. Mm, so I think great. part of it is just tasting a lot of coffees um, the tongue is a muscle. The mm -hmm. more you use it, the more you'll taste things. People who have really sharp palates are not always the best cuppers because they taste so much. You mm -hmm. want to taste the nuances. So part of it is just sampling coffees. If you have a chance to go to a coffee cupping, you know we're going to finally be able to start to do cuppings again during COVID. Obviously, we had to stop all of that. Um, but don't be afraid to try a number of different coffees, and it might be that you don't like one. If a customer now comes in and we make a recommendation mm -hmm. and they don't like it, I used to take that so personally. <laughs> it meant that it was bad quality. It's not yeah. bad quality. It's just not to your liking. Also, try to taste coffees when you haven't had really spicy or very flavorful foods because you're not going to taste um, things. We try and make sure that when our team are cupping, they have to have really clear palates. Yeah. Part of the reason I, I stopped liking judging at the major competitions is it's hundreds of cups of coffee you're sampling. <laughs> and I always felt badly that at the end that what you could actually taste, it just, I didn't feel it was equitable. Yeah. But I would, you know, you know taste a lot of different coffees. And even um, we, during the holidays, one of the gift boxes that we created, which was one of my favorites that we've done, is we put three cupping bowls in there and oh, three nice. coffees. And then there are these things called flight deck cards that someone came out. And so, you know, taste the same coffee and try it in three different cups and then try the flight. If it's a really good quality coffee, it should taste really wonderful when it's hot, lukewarm and cold. When we cup coffees, when we're thinking about bringing a coffee in, we have four cups in front of us and we're constantly sampling because you can mm. find the first cup is good and the next one you might taste something that's a little off. Mm. 
and then we keep tasting it, and ultimately we'll see where there might be defects. So, but it's, you know, I think that, you know, I, we, we trademark the phrase, especially coffee without the attitude. You know, you go some places and they've just made it so challenging for you just to enjoy it. You're meant to enjoy coffee and not feel put down. And if you pronounce, in the early days, people in our store would pronounce latte, laddie, and people would make fun of it. And I thought, that's, you've completely shut someone down from what's supposed to be a joyful experience. Right. Um, is anyone here a decaf drinker? <laughs> Congratulations, decaf is the new hot coffee. I mean, it's really, um, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, many of us feel that decaf drinkers are the real, true coffee drinkers because you're not drinking for caffeine, you're tasting, you're looking for the taste. Is there like a marked difference though between a decaf? I, sometimes I feel like decafs are not as pronounced or robust. There are, um, again, that's where knowing who you're buying from. Mm. Um, some people will buy cheap decaf. Decaf is expensive. I mean, think about it. You have to take, coffee is not decaffeinated in Kenya. It has to be shipped to one of the couple of countries in the world that decaffeinate. So it's going from Kenya. And what's the process to of Mexico. What, what are you doing? Well, there's a whole water process where you're actually pulling out the caffeine. I mean, it's really, and we only do water processed coffees. But there's this new sugar cane process, which is fascinating. And I just tried my first, it was a decaf Ethiopian sugar cane process. I've never heard of that. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. What and were you tasting in your mouth? What was so Well, no, the thing that? that was great, and we work really hard to make sure our decafs taste as good as our caffeinated. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the best Ethiopian coffees I've had. It was amazing it was flavorful and it was wonderful and then the headrester said and guess what it's decaffeinated wow that's cool i'm gonna drink a lot of decaf because then i can drink it all day and feel really good about myself this is well you know, <laughs> so you not getting over you know? but again i think it's a matter of as an individual like i had customers early on say i don't know if you want to hear this but since drinking your coffee i don't drink as much and i said well why is that and they said i used to drink just because i was looking for something to be satisfied i have one cup of yours and I'm satisfied with the one. And I said, that's what it's about. You know, I don't drink tons of cups, but boy, when I have, you know, a cup of coffee after a meal, I love. Mm -hmm. um, What's your favorite cup. from your lines? All the lines you know, it, it, and I tell people it's, I mean, it's literally where have I just been? <laughs> yeah. Um, we're right now, we have, we just brought in two unbelievable Rwandan coffees that I are extraordinary. We have a Colombian, um, Pink Bourbon we brought in, that's fantastic. We have another one that's even better. We're actually bringing our importer from Colombia to do an event for us March 12th. Oh, that's good for the, when you launch During, during restaurant week, if okay. anyone comes to Portland, look online, we've got two events. The VIP one is a, a conversation with Juan Carlos Sorengo about what it was to be um, you know, raised in Colombia and then coming to America. Mm -hmm. And now he's an importer trying to help the farmers within his region. That's and awesome had this yeah. amazing pink bourbon. So he'll be talking about that and we'll be sampling it. And then um, these two Rwandan coffees, the Burundi, I can't wait till it's landed. So it's, I'm constantly changing. And some of it depends too on, you know, what you're, what you're eating. How do you want to complement a meal? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have our wholesale business. You know, we, we, you know, we launched roasting in 98. We thought it would take over a year for us to transition to all of our own. Within three months, we were all our own. Within six months of roasting, we got a call from a chef named Sam Hayward. Gee, <laughs> Four Street's looking for a new coffee vendor. Are you interested in pitching it? We've been roasting our own for six months. Yeah. Um, Alan goes to pitch as an exercise. Yeah. Like This is what a great learning opportunity Mm -hmm. end up being there discussing with a chef, how do you finish a meal and let's look at the menu and talk about how do you, oh, that's great. how you begin the meal, the bread is important and how you finish it with coffee, both super important oh, yes. entry and exit. And um, Sounds great. we went back, brought yeah. four more coffees for them to try and ended up getting Four Street as our first wholesale account, not knowing we also got Street and Company and Standard Baking soon after. Wow, and, and they're still awesome. And they're still accounts 25 years later. Yeah, yeah. So. That's awesome. I think we have two questions right here. I'm so sorry we're going to hold off. There was a question. Uh, so uh, coffee's grown in the United States and Hawaii and, and Puerto Rico. Is there any other 
I had heard something about Corona Coffee in California. I didn't heard that. Well, did you see today? It was exciting. I mean, it's literally mm -hmm. Congress. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, you know, coffee here in the U.S. and where it's grown in, mm -hmm. in Hawaii and uh, Puerto Rico, um, Louisiana. Um, I was interested myself to see today in Congress and legislation. They're trying to help coffee farmers here in the U.S. And um, I saw Louisiana on the list, so mm -hmm. that was a surprise. I mean, chicory. Yeah. But, um, but so it is, I think it's developing, and again, because of climate change, uh, we, had, we have a coffee plant in our office, and people said, oh, it will never bear fruit. Guess what? Bears fruit. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised if ultimately things shift. Yeah. So keep an eye out, though, because this legislation will be very important to farmers in the coffee industry in the US. When you're drinking coffee, are you drinking it black always? <laughs> Am I drinking coffee black always? No, I don't. Um, when I'm cupping, I drink black all the time. But when I'm on uh, my own, I tend to add a little bit of soy milk or oat milk. Although I'm now, you know, oat milk is very distinctive. So I don't even, I'm finding I'm backing off from even that. But it is, again, it's a matter of what do you enjoy. We, we, we do flavored coffee, and that's very much poo-pooed in the specialty coffee industry. Mm -hmm. People do not do flavored. and. We have a whole separate room that's um, like a hazelnut flavor. It's an airlocked kind of room oh. so that the you know the aroma will not cross contaminate. Mm. Oh yeah. Um, and but we use the same quality coffee that we do, and it's a very subtle flavoring. So you taste coffee and you taste the flavoring. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but it is, and I did, again I tell people it's what you prefer. A lot of people have told me as they taste our coffee as time goes on, they use less and less sugar and they use less and less dairy or non dairy. Yeah. I never thought I'd enjoy the double dark Alonzo, and that's your darkest mm -hmm. coffee. I mean, I'm not that big of a coffee mm -hmm. drinker. When I tried it, I was like, this is so smooth. I don't. You're right. I didn't need as much half and half or sugar with it. It was so smooth and it was still robust and just wonderful. And it was exciting this week. We had three, you know, it's funny. Thank you for people who send compliments. And critiquing is important too. I tell everyone we need to learn and grow and, and uh, not everyone's going to love us. And, um, and we have this amazing new head roaster and he's apprenticing someone that this is a really big break for this young mm -hmm. man to create a new profession, this apprentice. And he's doing, I mean, it's amazing to see what's going on. And, uh, and we've had three back-to-back -back this week customer emails raving. And th what's been great for me is each one is about a different coffee that, that Phil has roasted. Oh, and, cool. and the new head roaster is a remarkable young man who his, his credentials are amazing. I can't believe that he said yes, he would join us. But part of the reason I love him is he's humble and he lets the team be in the spotlight. He trains them to a point, and now he's ready to let other people mm -hmm. get all the recognition, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. And he's fun. I mean, he'll come, wait till you see, wait till you try this. <laughs> you need so that. wait, there was someone else who had a question. You, you clearly could do amazing work anywhere in the world. I'm curious if you have a sense, or, or what your sense is, of uh, the impact of Portland and of Maine in this journey that you had? Uh, the, what is the impact of Portland and Maine in the journey because of where I travel? I, Bolivia is a really good example of if I was not living in an agricultural state, I think we have a really unique perspective here because of that and I have an amazing respect for farmers and land because of Maine. Mm -hmm. um, when I first came here when I was a child, I lived on Shabig Island and so Lobster and fishing is, is part of what I'm so respectful of. And, uh, but when we were to Bolivia as best of Bolivia, and you're there with other American companies and much larger than us, and I'll never forget there was blockading going on because of the political situation. And we were, so we were not allowed to travel freely. Farmers had to walk miles to come to meet with us. And it was very important that if they were selected, they were part of a project improving agricultural quality so they could get better money. And we were there and farmers, as we were going around in the circle, what they wanted to know is if you buy our coffee, will you let people know it's from Bolivia? And every other company said, Bolivian coffee is not well known, why would we do that? Hmm. And they got to us and we were like, how could we not tell the story of this journey? Here we are with this young national jury 
Um, they had actually never tried their coffee as an espresso, and our hotel had a broken down espresso machine, and Alan's really good technically, and he repairs the machine, and so we're teaching <laughs> these young so baristas right. how to pull shots. I mean, it was very powerful. And then, um, and during the competition, the blockades were getting closer because they discovered that the U.S. ambassador, a former president of Bolivia, a possible running candidate, were all there. And so we had to judge the competition and actually leave immediately through a back road um, to leave the event. And when we get back to US, we had committed to the winning coffee. The coffee had to go into hiding <laughs> and oh. eventually made its way to us. And so I told people, why wouldn't you want to tell that story? Plus, what we were tasting was better than at the time what we were getting from Colombia. So I mm -hmm. think Maine, for me, really that makes me appreciate agriculture. And also, mm -hmm. we're just good people. You know, I just, I really <laughs> think that we're good down to earth people and we really want to help one another. Yeah, it's a great question. We're gonna do what, cut last couple of questions here. Yeah. Go ahead. In your position, do you feel like a big company like Starbucks just gives lip service to them being more equitable in who they buy from? Are they just doing that to kind of mask over what's really going on? Or, or are they realizing that sustainability is something that will affect them down the road if they do? It's, you know, it's a really good question about Starbucks and sustainability practices. First of all, none of us who are in specialty coffee now would be where we are if it wasn't for Howard Schultz and Starbucks. You have, you, you mean, you have to acknowledge he created an, the entire category of specialty coffee. You know, generations had stopped, my age group had stopped. Mm -hmm. We weren't coffee drinkers. We were tab drinkers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> when, when they stopped producing tab a couple of years ago, I was in mourning. I'm posting <laughs> on Facebook and I'm crying. The tab has been phased out. But, but, um, but Howard Schultz really saw an opportunity. And not that coffee went away, but, but there was a whole generation. And then when he went to Europe and saw there was an opportunity to basically create a new narrative around coffee and did it brilliantly. I think you know Starbucks has grown so big, is so big now, and has shareholders and people they need to account to. It really becomes about the numbers, and it becomes more of a marketing firm from my perspective. And so, do they offer good coffee? It's it's okay, but there are micro lots and all these things that we have access to that a larger company wouldn't. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. It's yeah. if you go to Guatemala, people in Guatemala will tell you um, Starbucks saved coffee industry in Guatemala a number of years ago, what got tricky, uh, and because coffee pricing went, became quite low, and Starbucks at the time was very excited about Guatemalan coffee, and so uh, locked in a much higher price, mm -hmm. so it saved the industry there. Wow. The problem is then Starbucks moves on to another country they're excited about, and farmers who were only selling to Starbucks suddenly had no customer. Mm -hmm. So what we tend to educate our farmers with is diversify, um, mm -hmm. the, this micro lot situation that's happening is brilliant because I can buy an entire micro lot that no one else can get and the farmer can have other customers because I'll have an exclusive on this but not on this. But, mm -hmm. I, but I think it's a really good question in general with, with coffee companies. Um, not to create controversy here, but B Corp. We were B Corp certified twice and I opted this time not to renew because I felt that the way that it was being overseen right now was not equitable to small businesses. It was really, really difficult during pandemic and we were up for our renewal and uh, in the past I'd hired an intern to help me do, it's a volume of paperwork. It's a ton of work, yeah. It's a ton of work and it should be a ton of work but it was really difficult and so um, when, as we were asking for an extension we were told that it was inconvenient um, and I had to really think about that. And I started seeing other people getting certified and realized they were larger businesses who could hire a full-time person to do the work. Um, and then during that time, as I was really struggling about the decision, uh, Nespresso um, Nestle was certified B Corp. And I made the decision at that point to not renew. Yeah. Because I, at origin, the practices are really questioned. So it's, it's a really important issue. I tell people, ask the people you buy your coffee from transparency. We've chosen not to get certified. We are certified organic, but not everything we do is certified organic. It's sustainable, but all of our practices within our roastery have to comply with MOFCA and USDA. Um, but there are farmers who literally we know are meeting all of the organic practices, but absolutely cannot afford it, or will say to me, do I pay my workers more? 
do I pay to have better water or do I pay for the sticker on the bag? You tell me. So, but it's, it's a really important issue to ask right now about coffee. Yeah. All right. Someone I, else, if there's one, one other person. question. Okay. I think we're going to do our, uh, is there another question? Okay. So let's. Wait, there oh, is one. Okay. One last question. When I saw those red berries, uh, how, I only know coffee is a bean, little brown bean in the bag, and then I grind up. Now, how long would it take to turn those into real coffee beans? It's, I mean, it's a whole process, and again, because of the quality of what we're buying, Cherries ripen in different times, so that's where, you know, the, in this one country, the bracelets were important, that you're constantly going around and having to pick when they're ripe. Then they're taken mm -hmm. to a mill, and again, it, it varies farm to farm, country to country, as to how do you actually then extract the bean from the cherry, and there's a fermentation time. It takes weeks, and then, I mean, think about by the time we're getting it, it's, it's coming by a boat. So are they soft? When that color, uh... um, it's a good question. They should be somewhat hard. And, and trust me, don't try to bring a cherry home <laughs> on a plane with you. <laughs> it's gross what happens very quickly. <laughs> um, but, but you know, the thing that's interesting too as far as waste, this is uh, really important that um, this is a great compost. I mean, they don't waste anything on coffee farms. So the coffee cherry itself is used, you know, reused as compost. Also, there's something you may have heard, cascara tea. Um, there's the remnant from the dry process that it makes an amazing tea. We're actually thinking oh. of bringing the tea in this summer. Tea out of coffee. A tea oh. out of coffee, which is amazing. amazing. So it's, there are all of these byproducts in a matter of how mm. do you not waste. When we roast, when you see that, um, if you come to our roastery and you can see the green bean that we start with before we roast, it just looks like this hard bean. Mm. But once you roast, there's something on it you can't even see called silver skin. And as we roast, it actually gets burnt off. And our old roasters, we weren't able to collect it. Our new roasters are amazing in that they've got this cyclone heat and air program. So it mm. actually collects the silver skin in these big barrels. It is unbelievable chaff for farmers. And so we're able to take our barrels, bag them up, and then farmers can come and get this low pH compost for free from us. Oh, that's awesome. It's an amazing, amazing byproduct. Yeah. Mal, really, thank you so much. Thank you. For, for being you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. I'm gonna